Good evening, and thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Flowers Food First Quarter 2024 Results Conference Call. Please be advised that today's event is being recorded. I would now like to hand the conference over to your opening speaker today, J.T. Rick, Executive Vice President of Finance and Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you, Carmen, and good evening. I hope everyone had the opportunity to review our earnings release, listen to our prepared remarks, and view the slide presentation that were all posted earlier on our Investor Relations website. After today's Q&A session, we will also post an audio replay of this call. Please note that in this Q&A session, we may make forward-looking statements about the company's performance. Although we believe these statements to be reasonable, they are subject to risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially. In addition to what you hear in these remarks, important factors relating to Flowers Foods business are fully detailed in our SEC filings. We also provide non-GAAP financial measures for which disclosure and reconciliations are provided in the earnings release and at the end of the slide presentation on our website. Joining me today are Riles McMullen, Chairman and CEO, and Steve Kinsey, our CFO. Riles, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thanks, JT, and good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining our first quarter call, and um, we also appreciate everybody's flexibility in accommodating the change in timing for our Q&A session today. Our solid first quarter results reflect the increasing effectiveness of our portfolio strategy. Driven by investments in marketing and innovation, our brands gain share despite the challenging consumer environment. Significantly, we also grew branded retail volumes for the first time since 2020. Days Killer Bread led the way with its second, second consecutive quarter of 10% unit growth, but we saw encouraging signs across the brand portfolio. And we continue to expand our margins in our away from home and private label businesses. We are maintaining our financial outlook for the year, which incorporates continued volume improvement while acknowledging the ongoing economic uncertainty and its potential impact on consumer behavior and the promotional environment. As I mentioned in the prepared remarks, if there's one thing I'd like for you to take away from this call, is that we're doing exactly what we said we would do. Although progress is not linear, we'll continue to execute our portfolio strategy with the expectation of achieving our long-term financial targets. And I'm extremely confident in our growth potential, and I look forward to continuing our progress throughout 2024. So with that, Carmen, we'll open it up for questions. Thank you so much. And as a reminder, if you do have a question, press star 11 to get in the queue and wait for your name to be announced. Please stand by while we compile our first question. And it comes from Steve Powers from Deutsche Bank. Please proceed. Hey, guys. Good good evening. Thanks for the question. Um, I was actually hoping we could talk uh, start on um, just the, the operating expenses in the quarter and, and S. S- SDNA run rate spending. Um, you call that a couple of things in the prepared remarks. You know, higher labor costs, higher technology costs. You also separately call out stranded overheads. I was wondering if if those two things are related, or if those if that's if those are separate. And really, what I'm what I'm focused on is just how, how we think about the the cadence of of that SD that operating expense uh, expenditures over the course of the year. Um, you know, do we expect some relief on stranded overheads? Do we expect, um, you know, transition costs in California to replace that? Just some, just some direction on uh, the cadence of SDA expenditures over the course of the year would be great. Thank you. Sure, happy to do that. I'll start, and I'm sure Steve will want to chime in here too. But yeah, it's a little, it's a little bit of both. Um, you know, there's some labor expense in there. There's you know higher marketing expense in there, which we, you know, we've talked about before the rationale for that investment. Um, and you know, you you've got the stranded overhead too that we've we've talked about in the in the past. The good news is is twofold. Um, one, you may have noticed that we raised our savings range from 30 to 40 million to 40 to 50 million, and some of that will help us improve SDNA. As I as I noted in the prepared remarks, you know, we do recognize our our cost structure is a bit too high. And we're taking actions to pull some of that back and get get more back uh, back in in line. Um, you know, I mentioned the the labor cost and and, and marking as well play a play a role in that. So, you know, I would expect over time for us to improve um, SDNA, particularly as a as a percentage of net sales, and better leverage our our cost structure going forward. Steve, you want to add to that at all? Yeah, I mean, I think Rob hit on it. Obviously, the first quarter is 16 weeks. Um, you know, we did say see some elevated costs from that perspective, but, you know, we have good visibility to our cost takeout initiatives. 
and going forward, as a percent of you know sales, we do expect um, SDNA to pull back some and, and then kind of stabilize. So we do feel like we'll be able to get some of that under control as the year progresses. Yeah, the only other thing I'd add, Steve, relative to the stranded overhead, is that yeah, you know, this goes to the this actually goes to the volume story as well. Is that we are adding new business back at a bit of a faster clip than we originally anticipated at the beginning of the year, and of course that'll help cover that that stranded cost. Okay, very good. Um, and then in in terms of um, just use of cash, um, you know, I noticed that the, obviously the the capital expendi- expenditure outlook went up. Maybe a little bit more detail around what those um, supply chain investments are are targeted at. And then you also sounded a little bit more front footed um, with respect to an improved M and A environment. So maybe just some more color there as well. Yeah, I mean, the capital investments really are just, you know, ongoing improvements primarily at the bakeries, um, you know, increasing automation, um, updating equipment. Um, it's pretty normal course stuff, Steve, not out of the ordinary, but just a little bit more spend than we, than we originally thought at the beginning, at the beginning of the year. And then, yeah, the, the M&A environment, I am a little bit more bullish on that now. Um, activity is, has really started to pick up. That really started a couple quarters ago. Um, and has continued. So, you know, the conversations that we're having out there with with targets are increasing in 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 frequency, which um, which is a good sign. It's it's been a little slow the last couple of years, and um, you're very familiar with our balance sheet. So, you know, we're poised to to do a transaction when we find the right one. Yep. Very good. Very good. Hey, one last thing, if I could, just the on the the ERP pause. Uh, in the bakeries. I thought that was um, on track to be lifted in the second half. Just don't know if that's still the case or if, if that's been uh, recalibrated. Yes, no, we're still planning you know, to go back to the bakery rollouts. It's uh, starting sometime in the back half. Great. Um, All right. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. One moment for our next question. And it comes from the line of Bill Chappelle with Truist Securities. Please proceed. Thanks. Good afternoon. Hey, Bill. Just a, uh, maybe a, a little bit more about private label and 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 the branded growth, and just trying to a little more color there. You know, I, if anything, we if there's any real weakness in the economy, we hear it at the lower end. Obviously, private label has kind of receded over the past few quarters, but I you know, did know if you're surprised by brands holding up. If it's really Dave's Killer Bread accelerating. I mean, you said it was broader, but 10% growth for Dave's Killer Bread sounds pretty strong. So just maybe you could give us some more color thoughts around beyond Dave's Killer Bread, kind of how brands are doing versus private label and kind of how the consumer environment uh, is working out. Sure. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, Dave's has been sort of the star of the show from a from a volume growth standpoint. But, um, and I know you're asking, you know, uh, questions about the broader portfolio, but I, I will say just to start, one of the interesting things that we saw in the quarter was low-income shoppers coming back to Dave's. So we had mentioned to you all quite a while back that around 20% of Dave's shoppers, and we're defining that as 30000 or less in annual income, 20% of Dave's shoppers were low-income shoppers. Um, with, the, you know, uh, with the inflationary environment, that dropped off a little bit to about 16%, and we recovered almost back to 20% again. So, you know, that tells me that perhaps the, the consumer is getting a, a bit healthier, um, either that or, or they're tired of lack of differentiation and in, in cheaper products and are coming back today. So I, I see that as a good macro sign that lower income households are starting to come back. Beyond that, you know, we are seeing some strength in other parts of the portfolio, you know, wonder is a good example. That is a lower price point item for us, but Wonder across sandwich buns and rolls and a loaf has been doing quite well. Um, Nature's Own Perfectly Crafted continues to do well with positive unit growth in the quarter. Um, I think you know the one weak spot that we still have that we talked about in prior quarters is is sort of the broader basic Nature's Own product, whether that's honey wheat or or 100% whole wheat. You know that. That is the area of the category that has experienced the most weakness during this era of private label trade down. Um, I think some of that is starting to come back up out of private label into brands like Wonder. And if, if things continue to improve, 
you know, I'd expect it to continue to come back to brands like Nature Zone as well. Got it. Now that helps. And then, you know, a question I, we haven't really talked about in a long time is just kind of DSD network expansion. But where does that stand? Do you, are you still adding routes, be it in California or elsewhere today? Is it more about velocity and more products through the existing routes? Are you actually shrinking? Are there areas where it doesn't make as much sense uh, as you're trying to be more efficient? You know, any, any kind of thoughts on kind of the, the DSD network as it stands today would be helpful. Sure. Yeah, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. Now, California is its own thing because, you know, we're converting to company routes there. Um, but, you know, in some areas um, where we have higher growth, we're, we're adding routes because routes are starting to get full. When that happens, it, it's usually a, a quite a nice lift to sales to break up those routes um, and better service the stores in that area. So in some places, we're adding. Um, in some places on the, on the, on the fringe, um, we're not. Um, and in other areas, you know, as we move into new geographic territories, we're adding routes as well. So it, it kind of depends on where you are, what the growth trajectory is, how new the territory is. I think the key takeaway is that we are, what we're really trying to do is make our DSD network as efficient as it possibly can be. So, for example, if you're in an area where you've got, um, you know, lower uh, household penetration, lower market share, and, you know, those independent routes may be struggling, we might convert them to company routes for a while um, until we get, you know, enough sales. In other areas where we're growing, um, we'll split them up and actually add routes. So it really just kind of depends. The key word is Got efficiency, it. though. That's what we're looking for. Got it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. One moment for our next question, please. And it comes from Jim Salera with Stephens. Please proceed. Hi guys. Good afternoon. Thanks for taking our question. Yeah. Um, sure. I wanted to ask on uh, on the volume side in the pairs remark, Riles, you mentioned the uh, planned business side that's obviously contributed some headwinds on the volume side, and, and absent that, um, total company volume would have been positive. If, if possible, can you tell us what it would have been like? What the actual volume number would have been absent that? Uh, and beyond that, is the weakness in the other category primarily coming from some of the restaurant customers? Could you call it out some weakness in fast food? So any color around that would be helpful. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, we did say, Jim, if you, if you took the intentional strategic exits, and we didn't quantify it, but if you took the intentional strategic exits out, total company volumes would have been positive. The reason we're saying it that way is because we did this on purpose, as we, as we talked about. We had low margin business that was never going to be a big contributor, and we made the strategic decision to free that capacity up to move into higher margin business. The good news, and I think one of the larger stories of the quarter, is that's exactly what we're doing. We're beginning to lap all those strategic exits, so you'll see those um, continue to go down as we move through the year. We pretty much lap all of them in the third quarter, be very minor strategic exits in the, in the back half. And we're replacing that volume with business that meets or exceeds our variable margin targets, depending on what category of business we're talking about, whether it's branded or whether it's other. Um, so that's that's really the the key takeaway there. Okay, great. And maybe if I could dig in on uh, Dave's for a second. You know, continues to grow ahead of the category, which is great. Obviously, a, a very differentiated offering. Can you just give us a sense for where it continues to source volume from? I mean, is it other larger um, branded players? Is it bringing people from outside of the category? Just so we can kind of size up how long it can continue to run ahead of, you know, the broader category growth. Yeah, as we've looked at that, it's, you know, it has, it's taken some share from other players and, and especially premium and it's, you know, we, we look at days against the specialty premium category because we really don't have anything else to compare it to. Um, but it kind of stands apart even from specialty premium because the special premium segment of the category is really, really weak right now. Um, and, you know, Dave's is at a price point quite a bit higher than the rest of the specialty premium category. So it's really kind of hard to compare it to that. Um, and it drives the, you know, it, it pretty much is the organic brand category. Um, but to answer your question, yes, it, it brings new people back into the category just because of its, its quality and differentiation. But Jim, also remember, it's also household penetration. 
the household penetration for days is roughly half of what Nature's Own does. And so through our marketing investments, as we grow geographically, et cetera, we're growing that household penetration. So that's a big contributor as well. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. I'll hop back in the queue. Thanks. Thanks One moment for our next question. And it's from Mitchell Pinheiro with Sturdivant and Company. Please proceed. Yeah, hey, um, good afternoon. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. I'm curious. Um, you, you, you said you know you elevated the away from home um, part of the business to the uh, balanced growth um, as part of your strategy mix and and uh, your portfolio mix. And I thought um, I thought that was interesting. Uh, does that, you know, and, and that balanced growth means you're going to grow above the category. So well, what's driving that? I mean, you've exited from some, you know, some unproductive accounts. Um, does, are the accounts that you're in now growing in excess of the category and that's sort of why? Or is there ability to gain share but at, 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 a, at a strong margin? Um, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on, on that move. Sure. Well, first of all, I'm glad you noticed that. Um, it's it's an important point to make. Um, yeah, so now that we've freed our capacity up to pursue better business, um, you know, we felt that it made sense to move it into that category because we're gonna we're gonna place more focus on it now. That does not mean that we're going to over allocate resources to it. Um, to the detriment of the branded business, the strategy remains the same. We're moving to be a consumer-focused, brand-oriented company. But you know, when you look at the broader baked foods category, there is tremendous opportunity in a way from home that we can capture with limited investment. We don't have to do a whole lot in terms of capacity or um, automation, et cetera, to capture some of that volume. And there are opportunities out there, and customers who want us to serve them um, that are willing to deliver much fairer margins than we may have had in the past. So, you know, we've always talked about our away from home business being an important contributor to the company. And this makes sense because the more profitable that we can make that business, the more resources we're going to have to allocate towards innovation and marketing and all the fun stuff we like to talk to you guys about every quarter. So that's the rationale. Okay, thank you. And then, um, you know, you're, you're launching, you know, a lot of new products. Um, you know, I thought I thought I read eleven new products, and um, like, ha- how do you think about that? Like, first of all, in terms of priority of those new products, which ones are going to be the, at the top? And as 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 you know, these new products obviously would complicate. Um, certainly, you know, um, in the bakeries as you're as you're transitioning, you, you know, to things. Is that how, how do you think about like the new products? Is it is it going to be positive out of the gate as a margin contributor uh, in addition to sales? And I'd uh, love to hear your comments on that. Sure, great question. I mean, we go through a very rigorous process that covers every single one of the points you just made. We start with the consumer number one. Does the consumer even want this? Right? If the answer to that is yes, then we start looking at um, commercialization and financials and how does this fit operationally? Is it going to create complexity in the plant? If so, how much? And we don't launch anything that doesn't make sense for the consumer or doesn't make sense from a financial standpoint or doesn't make sense from an operational standpoint. We have to check all of those boxes um, before we'll launch anything. But it's a great question because we, you know, we go through that entire um, – that entire sort of funneling process, if you will, before we launch any of these new items. And these soft launches, launches, you know, go, go ahead. I'm sorry. Are, are these soft launches, or are there going to be more substantial rollouts? Yeah, there are there are some of them that are more regional, but you know, a lot of times, you know, because we can make this stuff in so many bakeries, Mitch, um, most of them will be throughout the network. Um. I had one more question um, on gross margin. Uh, it was um, it, it, it was a, it was a sizable uh, expansion in the quarter, um, and you know you talked about pricing contributing, but pricing's been contributing about that rate for the last several quarters. So it seems like 
you know, it, it's more than just that. And you called out some other things, but um, if, if you had to, you know, order them, I mean, I'd love to know which were the largest contributors. And then, um, it, you know, is it, is, is it price, is the mix um, really helping there at all or not? And then um, do you see, um, I know it's a large, long quarter, and you generally get some nice, you know, you get some volume, you know, some, some leverage there. Does that, do, are we going to see a drop off in gross margin in the second quarter? Yeah, it's just the speed. I mean, obviously, you know, we've had to, you know, we've taken considerable pricing to help mitigate some of the inflationary pressure. So that continues to really help from a top line and gross margin perspective. And the mix, you know, talking about Dave and the growth there, continue to see a really nice contribution overall from price mix. So, I would say that, you know, I'd rate that number one. And then, obviously, we had some nice commodity tailwinds coming into the year. Uh, and those continue primarily through the first half, some into the third quarter. And they start to wane some, you know, Q3 and Q4. So that's, that would be the, the second, I'd say, primary driver uh, outside of the top line from an overall gross margin perspective. Mitch, also, you know, as, as we talk about the savings initiatives, some of those are going to benefit um, gross margin, not just SCNA, but gross margin as well. And we also pointed to in the quarter, you know, we had a couple of discrete operational issues that we were working on that definitely impacted gross margin. Um, that if we had, you know, hit closer to plan, we would have we would have outperformed even the number we turned in on the bottom line. So, you know, as we get as we get those things squared away, it's just at two two bakeries. It's not the end of the world, but it did have a bit of an impact on the quarter. As we bring that more back in line, that's also going to benefit gross margin. It'll benefit the whole thing, but particularly gross margin. I mean, the forecast and expectation is <clears throat> to increase gross margin year over year, but obviously, you know, we'll, we're expecting up gross margin quarter by quarter, just different magnitudes. Okay. All right. That's all for me. Thank you. Thank Bye you. Guys. And as a reminder to our tele audience, if you do have a question, simply press star one one to get in the queue. One moment for our next question. And it comes from the line of Connor Rattigan with Consumer Edge. Please proceed. Good afternoon. Thanks for taking our question. Hey, Connor. Hey, so uh, in the prepared remarks, Riles, uh, you noted that you guys remain well below uh, pre-pandemic promo levels and that it doesn't really seem like there's a, you know, a real, real big notable lift on promo, um, but it does sound like your digital initiatives are really impacting your promo strategy. So I guess what learnings have you guys gleaned so far on the promo front from those initiatives? And also, um, if you're not seeing as strong of a lift as, you'd, uh, as you would like, um, sh should we maybe interpret that, that that may inform your uh, I guess your spending decisions as you kind of debate to debate the balance between um, using more promo versus marketing spend. Yes, absolutely. And you know, I will say, you know, it seems like the lifts have gotten a little bit better, but certainly not, you know, where we were, you know, pre-inflationary period. Let's say um, we did promote a little bit more um, in the quarter pre-targeted, but we did. Um, and but we're we're spending a whole lot less trade spend in order to do it, and and the you know the the digital tools that you mentioned are really helping us achieve that. You know we get better insights, we get better sort of post mortems, if you will, on um, on promotions, so that when we do them, we're generally doing them with a good a good positive return. But it's it's been tremendously helpful because I mean you 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 can see how much our our trade spend has come down over the last three or four years, and a lot of that has been enabled by these by these digital tools we have now via TPM. Got it. Very helpful. Um, and then just one quick follow-up for me. So uh, you guys also called out uh, the expectation for profitable business wins and, and uh, increased cost savings initiatives to flow through in the second half. Um, is this a change from any prior expectations, or was there maybe some sort of a shift of expected cost savings out of one queue into the back half, or just no change there? So no, we we were able to identify when we came out of the year, we had a, a we publicly remarked that we had a target of thirty to forty million, and as we really got into that, we uncovered further opportunities, and we've been able to raise that. Um, pretty confidently, actually, to, to forty to fifty million, and we're we're already enjoying 
some of those savings now. And in the prepared remarks, I listed out a few categories where we were where we were looking to um, to bring our costs back in line. Got it. Well, Thank you so much. Part? Oh, the new, but yes, yeah, sorry, the new business, Connor. Um, let me touch on that too. So again, summer relief when we started out the year, um, we had expectations for um, certain new business ones that we had really good line of sight to, and you know, as we move through the year and continue uh, move through the quarter rather, and continue to work on you know, refilling this strategically exited capacity, we ended up finding more than we thought we were going to, and so our expectations for that um, have increased somewhat. Um, nobody's asked us yet, sort of about you know how how the you know the cadence of the quarter went. So this is a good time as any to, as any to address it. Um, the quarter did start off a little weaker than we anticipated that it would. I know originally we had kind of signaled a, a first half weighted um, cadence to to the year. Um, that sort of unexpected weakness early in the quarter got us a little off a uh, little off cadence. However, now that we have these increased savings targets and we have um, we have a lot of sight to um, higher new business wins. Um, we think that that's going to be able to offset that, that early weakness, thus um, maintaining guidance for the year. So that's how all that sort of shook out. Thank you. And as I see no further questions in the queue, I will hand it back to Riles McMillan for final remarks. Okay, thank you, Carmen. Um, just like to thank everybody for taking the time today and joining us for questions. We very much appreciate your interest in our company, and as always, we look forward to seeing you again, seeing you again next quarter. Everybody, take care. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. This concludes the conference, and you may now disconnect. <laughs>